Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Once again, uh, we are here for a distinguished speaker series, as you saw there on the screen. Thank you for joining us, and we're excited to have Chair Nathan Fletcher joining us tonight. I'm Nancy Walters. I'm the Executive Director of the La Jolla Community Center. And as you can see, we have transitioned to virtual programming. With the rise of COVID and out of concern for the health and safety of our members and guests, we have decided to close the center for in-person programs through February 4th. Safety is our utmost priority, and we felt that this was necessary to keep everyone healthy and safe. If you're new to the La Jolla Community Center, we're a nonprofit organization with the mission of providing programs and services that promote lifelong learning, wellness, and friendship. We host daily classes ranging from language, fitness, and wellness to hosting series, author talks, concerts, and more. Most of our daily programs have transitioned over to virtual, with some, being, some programs being postponed for a later date. Please visit our website where you can see our full schedule of current and upcoming programs, and that's ljcommunitycenter.org. And if you have any questions, you can also give us a call. It's 858-459-0831. So before I introduce our speaker, Chair Fletcher, I would like to remind you that if you have the ability to send, that you do have the ability to send in a question using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen or somewhere on your screen, depending on what device you're using. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible. So it is my pleasure to introduce Chair Nathan Fletcher. Nathan Fletcher serves as Chair of the San Diego County Board of Supervisors. As chair, he is committed to ushering in a new era of bold, progressive policymaking, which aims to transform San Diego County for the better. He is focused on transforming our approach to behavioral health and making substantial investment in our mental health and drug treatment programs. <clears throat> a committed environmentalist, Chair Fletcher uses his position on the California Air Resources Board Board of Supervisors and as Chair of the Metropolitan Transit Agency to ensure we tackle climate change and work to ensure environmental justice. Starting in 2019, Chair Fletcher was a single voice of progressive policy on the San Diego County Board of Supervisors, where he generated almost 100 substantive policy changes in two years. His policies have focused on ways to build a better behavioral health service system, fight for environmental justice, make racial justice and equity the county priority, and improve the circumstances for children, working families, and immigrants. Prior to his election to the Board of Supervisors, Chair Fletcher showed a commitment to public service and leadership in tackling some of our toughest challenges. His life experiences range from leading classified human intelligence missions in combat zones and being decorated for valor under fire to passing landmark legislation as a member of the California State Legislature, to training Nobel Prize winning human rights activists in the developing world. Behavioral health is Chair Fletcher's highest priority as a policymaker. His vision is to build a patient-centered care coordination system that ensures those in need get the right care at the right time, and most importantly, get tailored outcomes to improve their lives. Additionally, Chair Fletcher has worked with international non-governmental organizations to build and improve dem dem democracies and protect human rights in many countries and other global strategic initiatives. Chair Fletcher also spends his time teaching courses on public service, political science, California government, and civil rights as a professor of practice at the University of California, San Diego. In his personal time, Chair Fletcher is an Ironman triathlete and, a, and avid outdoorsman who enjoys surfing, alpine mountaineering, and glacier climbing. He and his wife, Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez Fletcher, have five children and live in the vibrant city heights community of San Diego. Please help me welcome Chair Nathan Fletcher. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nancy. And it's uh, it's one. 19 uh, was uh, the last time I was with you, and that, that feels like a lifetime ago. Uh, I know uh, we've all uh, gone through so much and, and endured so much um, throughout the last few years uh, with everything that is, is, uh, has happened in our retreat. Um, but through all of it, we're still here and we're still getting up every single day, uh, committed members of our community, elected officials, all of us trying to figure out how uh, can we make our communities a little bit better place, uh, a little more fair, a little more opportunity, opportunity uh, a little more just. Um, and, you know, through anything that, that the world or pandemics or anything else throws out at us, uh, you know, I never lose sight. And certainly I have an incredible team of folks who work in my office, never lose sight that every day with all of our imperfections and flaws and 
mistakes and challenges. We get up every single day fighting to try and do that, trying to serve the people um, of San Diego County. Uh, when I was here in 2019, I talked a lot about uh, change and change uh, being a distinguishing hallmark uh, of, of our American society. You know, we always say that path to a more perfect union is, is not smooth, it is not even, it doesn't always go in a consistent direction. Um, but it's a part of what we do every day. When we see challenges and we see problems and we see things uh, that, that we think can be improved upon, um, then we gotta pick it up. And we, gotta, we gotta tackle them and, and do everything we possibly can uh, to, uh, to move that in a new direction. Um, and, you know, I just wanna briefly give you an update on a couple of the, the priorities or things that, that we're really working on um, that I think are of critical importance um, as we move ahead into the new year and then really reserve the bulk of the time to just open it up to your questions, your comments, your thoughts, your criticisms, uh, your, your suggestions, um, and any of those things as we move forward. Uh, last week, I was reelected uh, by the Board of Supervisors to be the chair. Uh, it hasn't happened in about 70 plus years that someone has done consecutive years as chair. Uh, but, you know, I appreciate the support of my colleagues uh, in that uh, decision. And I also appreciate uh, that it was a bipartisan vote. Uh, it was a unanimous vote. Um, and, you know, so often with the world being dominated by divisions, uh, we tend to lose sight of the fact that, you know, we, we can still have ideological differences and values differences. We can still not support the same things. Uh, but it is possible for us to, uh, to find those areas to work together and, and figure out how to do it. And so I'm grateful uh, for the unanimous bipartisan support of my colleagues to, to lead our county uh, into a second year. You know, as we go into the new year, um, I think we have a number of priorities uh, that, that we have to tackle. Uh, COVID continues to dominate uh, the media coverage and, and the news out there and certainly dominate a lot of our thinking. Um, the reality is the situation we face today is fundamentally different uh, than it was in the past. We now have a vaccine. Uh, San Diego County has done incredible uh, at, at utilizing the vaccine, our, our fully vaccinated rate, uh, if we were a state, would be one of the highest uh, in the entire country. Uh, as a county, we're one of the highest counties in, in San Diego County. Um, and because San Diegans have listened to their doctor, uh, gotten vaccinated, uh, you know, even the new strains of COVID present a, a much less critical situation, not in that you know, we want everyone to get it or we should just let it run rampant. But the, the, the reality is the actions we took during the pandemic were to avoid a collapse of the healthcare system. There's certainly a strain on the healthcare system with Omicron and, and the residual Delta that's in our community. Uh, but we're not at risk like we were in, in preceding times pre-vaccine uh, in having a, a collapse of our healthcare system. So it puts us in a different position. And I think we're going to be uh, coming out of Omicron here in the days, we've certainly seen encouraging numbers in the last few days. And I think over the course of the next week to 10 days, we'll continue to see that decline. Um, and then with the, again, with the presence of the vaccine, the availability of the boosters, uh, along with what we know, the threat to the integrity of the healthcare system is, is not what it was before. And so I think in 2022, uh, we will be transitioning out of that, hopefully being a daily focus. Uh, get it in a little bit more of an endemic state, uh, the likes of which we would do the flu and, and other types of things that, that we move. Uh, and then really move on to the other big and pressing issues we face as a region. Uh, chief among them, obviously, the challenges surrounding the unsheltered and homeless. I'm going to talk a fair amount about that. You know, as a county, the, the main role we provide is that of, of service provider uh, for mental health and drug treatment services. Um, and, and we are stepping up our game to do more of that. Uh, the incorporated cities, of which all of you are lawyer in the city of San Diego, the incorporated cities uh, generally do the structures. Uh, they do the locations, the, the physical places where people will go. And then the county joins them and supports them in those efforts by better providing services. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people, and, and I understand, you know, there's multiple levels of government and a lot of things, but, but you know, we, we get a lot of people saying, hey, you know, you need to go build more structures. And again, what the county primarily does is that service provider. When a city has a shelter location, the city acquires a motel, the city has a room for someone to go into, then the county can partner with them uh, to help provide the mental health and substance abuse services. In the unincorporated areas, more rural areas than we are, uh, in those instances, we're responsible for both. And, and we're doing a considerable amount in the unincorporated uh, around hotel voucher programs and other types of things. But certainly we all need to do more. But I'll talk in a minute more broadly about how we're trying to rebuild uh, the behavioral health system. The goal would be 
uh, not allowing individuals to become homeless to begin with and addressing a lot of those issues upstream. Uh, and I'll certainly talk about that. There's obviously a need for more housing. Uh, the cost of housing in San Diego is, is simply unaffordable. Uh, we got to figure out how we put it at the right place uh, and make it available at the right cost. But the reality is somebody who works full time uh, should not live in poverty and somebody who works full time ought to be able to afford housing. And a part of that is tackling the wage issue uh, and not having such low wage jobs. Uh, and, and part of that is tackling the availability of housing. And so that's certainly a, a, a top of mind issue. Uh, another issue we hear a lot is the safety of our communities. Uh, are people safe? Uh, there's certainly a rise in violent crime. That's not unique to San Diego or California. Uh, it's happening in Texas and Florida uh, and other places. But, you know, how do we keep our community safe? Uh, how do we tackle issues of, of, you know, just in the last week, we're tackling issues of, of unregulated, unserialized ghost guns, a huge increase. Law enforcement is very concerned about. Uh, but how do we make sure our communities are safe, having law enforcement there, uh, also protecting them from, from those dangers? Um, and then the, 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 the last issue, and then I'll, I'll go in a little bit more depth into some of these are issues around the, the working class and middle class. And I'm deeply concerned uh, at the erosion uh, of the middle class and working class folks. Um, you know, the, the recession associated with the pandemic is the most uneven in history. Uh, the really wealthy did really well and made a lot of money. Uh, and people that get up and go to work every day, uh, they, 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 they took it pretty hard. And issues of income inequality are, are real concerns to me because when you lose the middle class and you lose the working class, you lose the stepping stone or the ladders uh, that people climb to as, as, as they move forward. Um, and so whether we're talking about issues of misclassification of workers, uh, of service workers or low-wage workers being exploited, um, I value and appreciate hard work. And I was raised in a working class uh, family, you know, we got up, we worked hard, but people who work full time should not live in poverty and, and the average wages of American workers shouldn't be stagnant at a time when the stock market is soaring, the number of billionaires we create is soaring, uh, and the wealth of not even the 1%, but the one-tenth of 1% are soaring. Uh, we had a fight in San Diego where Amazon pulled out of a potential warehouse on county-owned land because they feared that they might have to pay a living wage. Now imagine that the wealthiest corporation in the history of humanity terrified that maybe they'd have to pay their workers a living wage on publicly owned land. Uh, those are the types of fights that are controversial and difficult, but I think we've got to lean into those. And I think we've got to, you know, be on the side of folks who get up and go to work every single day. So, you know, that's a, a, a general kind of table set of, of, of what we're doing. Um, let me focus in just for a moment around uh, behavioral health issues. And gosh, three years ago when I was with you, I talked about what we wanted to do. And what we wanted to do was was invert the approach. Generally, folks who are behavioral health being the intersection of mental health uh, and substance abuse. And, you know, right now, or, or traditionally, folks have gotten to a level of crisis. Um, and then they say, we need more locked inpatient 5150 psych hold beds. But the reality is the need uh, for a locked inpatient 5150 psych hold bed is really a damning indictment of our failure as a system of society to allow people to, to get to that level of crisis. Now, it's gonna happen and we're always gonna have those services available, but we're really trying to rethink that system and how do we get people help care early? And how do we uh, invest in that? And if somebody does get to the level of needing crisis care, once they get stable, how do we get them in an ongoing system of care, a continuous level of care uh, where, where they're getting the ongoing help to keep them stable and, and keep them uh, living a, a productive life? Um, and so a key part of that is changing the input into the system. Uh, we obviously want to lower the number of people that are in crisis, but while we work towards that goal, we wanted to fundamentally change uh, the interaction. And right now, if someone's having a mental health crisis, uh, substance abuse crisis, uh, you call 911 and they, they historically, not right now anymore, we've changed it, but you know they would dispatch law enforcement and an ambulance and a fire truck. And the reality is this is not what law enforcement is trained to do. Uh, it's not what we want them to do. We want them to keep our community safe uh, from violent predators and violent crime, and, and we want them to do that, uh, not to be the uh, mental health first responder. And over the years, we've added PERT clinicians. Those are psychiatric emergency response teams. They're embedded with law enforcement. They're wonderful folks who do incredible work. Um, but again, if we don't have to send law enforcement to the call, we, we, we ought not. And so we have now launched, and it was a considerable investment by the county, 
uh, but we now have countywide mobile crisis response teams. So if that individual in crisis is not a danger to themselves and they're not a danger to anyone else, then we don't need to send law enforcement. We can send MCRT, mobile crisis response teams, trained clinicians. They're accompanied by someone who has lived experience, a peer support specialist, and, and they can get there and work with that individual, assess that individual. They've got the time, uh, they've got the training, and they can figure out, hey, what is the right way to get this person some ongoing help in a positive way? Uh, 54,000 911 calls uh, last year were psychiatric related. Law enforcement responded to all of them. Again, if that individual is a danger to themselves or a danger to someone else, then law enforcement has to go, but we want them accompanied by a PERT clinician. If they're not a danger to themselves or someone else, then we want mobile crisis response teams to go. Uh, so those are up and running countywide. Invariably, with just recent in the last few months, we've got it up and running countywide. That was a significant undertaking. You're talking about new staffing, uh, new vehicles, new protocols, new training, but they're up and running. Uh, the primary way that they're dispatched presently is people call the access and crisis line, um, and they can be dispatched from there. But we are integrating them into the 911 system where 911 operators will be able to triage the call and then divert that call to MCRT uh, instead of law enforcement. Uh, in the event law enforcement arrives and determines the individual is not a danger to themselves or to someone else, then they can call for mobile crisis response team. Uh, to uh, show up and provide help. And we've, we've been getting some really good reports uh, about how those are working and, and what's happening. The second thing is when MCRT gets you, we gotta have more places for them to take you uh, to be able to get the array of services that you need. Uh, we've been working very hard with UC San Diego Health and it's gonna take us a little bit to build, but you know we're looking at about $115 million investment in a regional behavioral health hub in Hillcrest. Uh, on some county owned land, it's central to the county. And there we can provide the array of mental health services that folks need from crisis stabilization, kind of just short of 24 hours to inpatient to outpatient, all of the array of services that individuals may need in, in one location. Uh, it's also a good place when someone gets discharged from the emergency room, uh, they could go here and get some follow on care and get really hooked into that, that system of care coordination and that person centered care coordination um, for how we can go. Uh, we've also increased and are increasing our crisis stabilization units. Uh, we have uh, opened a new one in North County. We have a second one coming online in just a few weeks. Uh, we've got more in South County, East County, and others. These are places that MCRT can take you, law enforcement can take you. Again, crisis stabilization, they can hold you for 23 hours and 59 minutes, stabilize you, figure out, hey, what's going on? What's the ongoing care? Um, and get you into a good system of treatment. And, and we've had really good response. But again, you know, it's taken us a few years since I came into office. We fund it, we say build it, but it takes a little bit to get the building and work through the issues. But those are coming online um, and providing more opportunities. And so I think, I think that's going to give us a, a, a real positive uh, step forward in terms of having more access um, for folks regionally. Again, for unsheltered folks, the structure where they go, that's primarily the responsibility of your city government. But as a county, we can help provide some of the emergency response services and help build out uh, some of these behavioral health things that are, that are out there. We also had a very creative uh, behavioral health impact fund where we made about 25, well, not about, we made $25 million available um, for someone who provides mental health or drug treatment services. And they have a revenue stream to pay for it. Say drug Medi-Cal, uh, they can draw down, but they don't have money to buy a building, expand a building, increase service offerings. And so we offer that one-time infusion. You know, we'll help you with the one-time infusion in cash to expand the number of beds you can provide services. And then you can show and demonstrate an ongoing commitment. Um, and in just a few weeks, we'll be sharing uh, one of the big uh, things coming online uh, that will help there. And I'm very excited about that. And I think, again, it's another... Um, thing that we do throughout this. And then we've had a real problem in our jails. Uh, if you watch the news or see the news, you realize the jails have uh, had a real challenge and problem with folks, particularly folks with substance abuse or mental health. Um, I, you know, fought a little bit with the sheriff and then we worked out a, a, an agreement where he agreed to do medication for addiction treatment in our jails, vitally important uh, that we provide those early substance abuse treatment there. But we also need more clinicians uh, in the jail. Uh, we need more trained medical staff, uh, mental health staff, we need more trained social workers connecting people upon discharge to housing opportunities and services when they get out. Uh, in our last budget, we literally added several hundred uh, clinicians that will go into our jail. We still have to hire them, uh, onboard them, uh, get them staffed. 
uh, get it all stood up. But again, it's moving in the right direction. And that leads me to my, one of my last points here around behavioral health is, is one of the real problems we face is a critical shortage uh, of workforce. There are simply not enough mental health and drug treatment folks out there uh, to meet the need and demand. And you know, one of the things that holds us back in our ability to provide more opportunities uh, for some of the unsheltered with mental health or substance abuse issues is we cannot find people to staff the facilities. Uh, you know, if you could bring a shelter online, a shelter has to have services. Uh, if you could get a, a motel or hotel that would take it, someone has to be there to provide services. And absent that service component, uh, you simply uh, can't do it. You have to, an obligation if you're going to house someone or shelter someone to provide the services. And so we've had a real struggle and a real limiting factor uh, on so much of our ability regionally to do this is just a shortage of folks. And, and so we're trying to work with community colleges, with other providers. Some of these are not inherently psychiatrists or psychologists. They may be um, more of a uh, uh, less intensive or, or time demanding training. So how do we get those programs up? How do we recruit people in? And then how do you retain the folks you have? You can get a pretty high burnout rate in some of these difficult jobs. How do we support that worker, keep them healthy, keep them engaged, pay them fairly, pay them responsibly and do that. Uh, and so all the programs we launch are dependent upon their success in having workers who can come in and fill those jobs who are trained. Um, and that really has been a pretty critical backlog and challenge that's held us back in a lot of ways. Uh, we continue to give raises, continue to pay more, uh, but sometimes we just end up cannibalizing some other county's workers. And, you know, if that helps San Diego, we can do that, but that's not a long-term solution. We, we need to open that pipeline and spick it. Uh, and I'll always fight to uh, to make sure that we're paying people well. So in general, that's that's the the, parent, the system we're trying to do. We've also invested in mental health screenings for kids in school. We want to get kids early connected to services, prevention. Uh, you know, we're doing a lot of work around harm reduction and substance abuse. How do we get people into treatment? Uh, how do we lower the risk? How do we adopt things we know work like needle exchange programs, syringe services and others? Uh, they can be controversial, but we know are the single most effective thing we can do to get people into treatment uh, and get people before they get to the point of crisis. And so all of that work and efforts um, are certainly going to uh, continue uh, as we move forward. Uh, and again, that's for everyone out there. That's not just for individuals that are homeless. We want a better mental health, behavioral health system for everyone out there. And then when homelessness, again, we're working with the cities as they acquire locations or uh, shelters or motels uh, to provide that, then we can step in and provide services. Uh, and we will certainly uh, continue to do that. Um, I think when I was with you a few years ago, I talked about our efforts around child welfare. Um, you know, the county is uh, a child in need. We're the foster care uh, provider, the, the overarching entity that, that works with all the partners. Our child uh, uh, social workers go into homes when there's an issue of neglect. Uh, when I came into the county, we had just received a report, uh, very critical of our child welfare system. I, actually, that was received before I was sworn in, right before I was sworn in. Uh, I got sworn in at 88 recommendations. I said, I think we ought to adopt them all and get them done. And we have chipped away. 86 of them are fully implemented. Uh, there are two left that are in the process of being implemented. And, and we're just a few weeks or a month away from all 88 being, being done. Uh, we have done so many changes around child welfare. And now, as we move forward, we got to really look at the fundamental shift around, just like in, in behavioral health, we don't want you to get to the level of crisis. The same is true with children. Uh, we don't want their environment to get to the level of neglect where it requires the county to remove a child. If a child's a danger, we will always be there to remove that child. But that's a very traumatic event uh, for the child and the family. And so how do we focus on supporting families, uh, identifying early signs of poverty of, of substance use, of mental health, and how do we try and infuse services and provide help and assistance to that, to that, to that family so that the child doesn't get in a situation uh, where they are at risk. And, and so that is something that we're working hard to make that fundamental shift around child and family strength. Again, we're not gonna leave a child in a dangerous situation, uh, but just like the goal ought to be avoiding someone getting to a state of crisis, we wanna avoid a situation where a family's in a state of crisis that requires us as a county to remove that child. And so again, it's, it's, it's shifting uh, that mindset um, and really infusing early services and help. Uh, we've also made some really significant changes to our juvenile probation system um, and helping those kids who have made a mistake 
uh, get the trauma-informed care they need, uh, get the help they need, and let's try and get those kids' life back on track. We don't want the juvenile probation system to become a pipeline to permanent adult incarceration. Um, and and I, I feel really strongly that we have to, you know, try to help these children uh, who have been in a bad situation, uh, help the families and see if we can't uh, get their life back on track and, and, and move forward. 60% of the calls we get into our child abuse hotline are related to neglect. Uh, that's where we've got to infuse that help and services um, before it gets to the, the, the point of abuse. And so we're going to certainly work around that. Uh, another critical issue around uh, children really is the issue of child care. Uh, it is a struggle to find quality, affordable child care, even if you have a job and you have the funds to pay. Uh, I'm really hopeful that the federal government will, will come back with a second component of, of Build Back Better uh, and really invest. We're one of the few industrialized nations uh, in the world that doesn't have readily available quality, affordable child care. Um, that's not only in the children's interest, that's in the parents' interest. You know, you have a lot of uh, folks who do the math and realize that it would cost them as much or more to go to work as it would to be able to provide child care. Uh, so barrier, especially often women are, are the ones bearing the uh, challenge. And so we want kids to in child care and we want the families to be able to do it. Um, and we spent a lot of money during the pandemic on just kind of emergency child care vouchers, but that's not a sustainable solution. We need more child care workers, we need more child care locations, and we need an ongoing way that that child care is affordable um, for, uh, for people who are out there at work. So I'm, I'm interested in spending uh, a lot of time this year coming ahead working on issues of child care. Um, last two things I'll touch on just briefly are issues of the environment. Uh, climate change is, is real. We're dealing with the impacts of it now when we look at weather patterns, at lightning strikes, at droughts, at severity of wildfires. Um, you know, San Diego is uniquely vulnerable. We have issues of sea level rise and coastal erosion, uh, flash flooding, wildfire, all of that is going on. Uh, the county for years had a climate action plan that courts consistently said uh, did not meet the threshold it needed. So we are going to have a climate action plan that is, is legally valid and really helps us move forward in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that is going to take a little bit. It's a, it's a reasonably long process to do that and do that right, but that is underway. Uh, we're also looking at a regional decarbonization strategy uh, about how we really get out of the fossil fuel, uh, GHG dominated uh, sectors of our economy uh, and, and try and decarbonize. But a key point on this is we have to make sure there's a just, just transition for workers. Uh, we can't take workers who have good jobs, good union jobs, and have them in, a, in an old industry that we don't want as much of in fossil fuels and have them displaced by low wage, uh, non-competitive paying jobs in the renewable industry. We need to make sure that those jobs are good. We can both fight for the middle class and fight for climate change, but we gotta do both together. Um, and that's a really important component as we look at decarbonizing our economy is protecting those workers and ensuring retraining um, and, and placement into as good or better paying jobs um, as what they had in the future. And so we will continue uh, working around that. And then finally, issues of the transportation sector are really important. I'm still uh, remain chair of the MTS Metropolitan Transit System. Uh, I'm very proud of how our agency did during COVID. We did not miss a day. Uh, we provided service uh, to San Diegans. A lot of folks are transit dependent. They got no other way to get to work or the grocery store or the doctor's appointment. Uh, as an agency, uh, we move hundreds of thousands of people every single day. Uh, we do it for one of the lowest investments from taxpayers of any transit agency in this country. Uh, we do it with a better on-time record, a better safety record um, than, than almost anywhere else. We're a really good agency. Uh, very limited in how much funding we get compared to other transit agencies, but we do everything that we can uh, to meet, meet that need. Uh, so we're going to continue to provide service. Uh, we, pre-COVID, were one of the few transit agencies that was seeing ridership gains, month-over-month -month ridership gains, more people using our system. Um, and obviously COVID had an impact and we're now rebuilding our ridership as, as people, you know, get out and, and move around a little bit more. Uh, obviously very excited the Mid Coast Trolley Extension. Uh, you can now go from uh, the U.S.-Mexico border uh, all the way to UTC in one seat. Uh, really excited to be able to connect UC San Diego. Uh, UTC is one of the, one of the, the fastest growing uh, economic regions. Uh, in San Diego and to be able to connect that the VA center where I go to get my health care uh, and, and really helping a lot of workers 
uh, get to work and a lot of students and families uh, be able to move around. And, and so that's an important thing. And at MTS, we're also uh, committed to our clean air responsibilities where we have uh, retired all of our diesel buses. We don't have a single diesel bus left in our inventory. Uh, we have low emission CNG buses, but we are rapidly moving towards adopting uh, zero emission electric buses. Uh, you may see them out there occasionally. They're green. They're, they're not the normal red and white. Uh, but we're building out the charging infrastructure, the capacity, uh, and working through our commitment to have a fully zero emission electric fleet by 2040, uh, which will be here uh, quicker uh, than we think. Um, so that's just an update. I know there's a a multitude of other issues that, that could be on your mind and are likely on your mind. The final point uh, I want to share is I'll always be available to you all to answer questions and talk about issues in my office. will be here. Uh, with the new redistricting, though, I, I no longer represent La Jolla. Uh, La Jolla uh, and the coastal communities were, were moved to, uh, to another district. Your new uh, supervisor will be Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Uh, you'll be in very capable hands uh, with her. My district shifted down and east a little bit. Um, and uh, so despite the fact that I, I had the honor of representing La Jolla uh, when I was in the assembly and, and for my first three years on the board of supervisors, uh, I now longer uh, am no longer La Jolla's official representative, uh, but certainly appreciate you all as a group and I've always enjoyed visiting with you and we'll be around to uh, answer issues and questions and, you know, we'll We'll still be here. I'm still chair of the board. We have some countywide responsibilities. Um, but from and you live in Hawaii, you won't have that opportunity anymore, uh, at least not in next year's election. Uh, but uh, certainly we will, we will remain accessible and available. So with that, that's the bulk of, of what I wanted to share. And we would love to just take questions and criticisms. Anything is all, all fair game and good. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We do have many questions. Um, so I'm going to just get started. They'll they're kind of all over the place, so we won't stick with one topic, we'll just bounce around. So one Good. is um, from Amy, she's saying, what reasonable accommodations for the medically com compromised seniors experiencing homelessness while they wait on their permanent supportive housing match? The county hotel was a great solution. Well, the county hotel, we, we did the best we could with limited service providers. Um, now, every single city uh, in San Diego County had the same access to draw the same funds to provide the same hotel rooms. Um, the county stepped up to do as much as we could. We certainly do even more in the unincorporated areas where we have the land use responsibility, uh, but, but we've staffed as many of those as we can get services for. And I think the reason that individual cities uh, didn't launch their own uh, hotel motel programs was again, because of a shortage of, of service providers. Um, the program we did do got considerable criticism um, folks felt that their services weren't enough or robust enough. It was really heartbreaking. A few folks died in the, in the hotels where we had folks and, and we did everything we could and we continue to do everything we can. Um, but again, there's limitations on the ability to staff them and provide the services in them. Uh, traditionally as a county, we would not have done any of those in incorporated jurisdictions. We would have had the cities do that and then we would have helped provide services. Um, but it was a, a a pandemic and we were moving as fast as we could. So I, I wish every day that we could have bring more of those online. I wish we could staff more of those. I wish we could get more folks, um, you know, off the streets. Um, but it, it's, it's been very, very challenging. As the public health agency, we do shoulder 100% of the, the responsibility for COVID positive people who have nowhere else to go and isolate. And those rooms have been challenging as well. We're working, uh, we have been working since the onset of Omicron and Delta uh, to, to, to bring up more, more of those isolation rooms. Um, and we continue to try and do that. Uh, but Omicron hit the staffing issues just the same in that, you know, we lost a lot of the staff that we counted on to run and administer those programs. Um, and so it's, it's been a very challenging situation, difficult situation. We're trying to help as many people um, as we can. There, there are just some limiting factors in how many of those you can do. Uh, we've also run into challenges uh, once once we came out of the restrictions and had the vaccine. There, there weren't as many hotels that were willing to rent uh, or rent or contract with us for rooms, um, in particular the COVID positive rooms and even uh, some of the rooms for the high risk uh, unsheltered. They just uh, uh, weren't, weren't interested in doing that. So it's it's been challenging. Uh, we're trying to help as many people as we can. I wish we could do more. Um, but, um, you know, we're, we're absolutely doing the best we can to help as many people as possible. 
Okay, this question is from John. Could you comment on your support of a statewide system ensuring shelter and housing as a legal right? Yeah, this is something I, I, I support this. And um, this got lost in the, in the, in the mix of, of COVID. The governor pre-COVID uh, called for a statewide task force on, on kind of homeless uh, and unsheltered situations. And, you know, they wanted me to participate. And generally a task force is what people in my line of work do when they, they just don't want to deal with the problem. They create a task force to kind of delay it kind of thing. Uh, I'm not, that's not what the governor intended, but that was my skepticism around these, these sorts of issues. And I said, oh, you know, and we can propose some bold ideas. And the, the recommendations that we came out with, I think were, would have been be transformative, but literally we released the report the week that COVID was taking over and dominating, and it didn't get as much traction or attention as it should have. And I hope the legislature will take it up. But essentially, in a nutshell, what we called for was creating a legal obligation, meaning cities had a legal responsibility uh, to provide housing for every single person in their city and to provide a legal responsibility for counties uh, to have to provide mental health and drug treatment services for anyone who needed them and to make that enforceable via a private right of action, meaning an individual if it was not available could sue. And this would be transformative in the approach to homelessness. One of the challenges of homelessness is if your road is not paved, you know exactly who to blame. There's a city, if you live in an incorporated city, that's their responsibility. Uh, if you're in the unincorporated, then it's the county's responsibility to, 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 to pave your road. And so one of the challenges with homelessness is it is no one's direct responsibility. It's a little bit the city, a little bit the county, a little bit the state, a little bit the federal government. And, and so everyone tries and they try really hard, but in government, you tend to do what you have to do first. And then after what you have to do, uh, you do the things that, that you would like to do. So, for example, there's not a second grader in the whole state that doesn't have a classroom to go sit in. Now, not every school is equally good, but we manage to build schools and we fight site schools and we put teachers in schools and every kid has a classroom to go sit in because you have to do it. Uh, the city of San Diego had to get in compliance with the Clean Water Act, and so they built the pure water facility and did all those types of things. And so I think it would really be transformative if there was a legally enforceable obligation uh, on cities to provide a place for people to go and on counties to provide services. You'd have to have dedicated funding streams. You'd have to phase it in over time. You couldn't immediately uh, make it. It would take some time to catch up, but I think it would focus the energy and efforts and also help break through some of the opposition. Every time uh, we have a, a homeless facility, uh, we just opened one in Midway, uh, reasonably small, 40 rooms designed for high need individuals. Um, and, you know, we got a lot of pushback and, and concern. Uh, we tried to buy a motel in, in La Mesa. Uh, it would have been 140, 150 rooms. Uh, it could have been brought online in a matter of months. And the city of La Mesa managed to stop that, even though it would not have cost them a dime of their own money. We had $26 million of state and other funds to go in and do that. Uh, but they were able to stop it. And so, you know, one of the challenges is every time you have a solution, everyone says, well, that's great, but it can't be here. You know, you need to fix it somewhere else. Um, and if you had to do it, I think I think that would help as well. And so, um, you know, we'll see if the legislature might take up that concept. But certainly a, a, a big group of folks, county supervisors, mayors, uh, experts around this. And if we had to do it, I think you'd have more elected officials who would be talking about issues of wages, uh, of cost of housing and addressing the root cause of poverty. Uh, and I think that, that could be could be very helpful as well. Thank you. Um, from Davida, what initiative are you proposing for increasing the supply of tiny houses? And what what you would you suggest we do to support higher minimum wages, realistic social security, et cetera? As an adjunct, how can we support labor unions? Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, so all right, that's good. You got like five questions in one. I like that. Uh, so on the on the tiny homes in the it, the county government has very little in that. Our land use areas are the more rural areas. It's it's not, uh, you know, we've certainly done things around making ADUs and, and those types of things easier. Uh, where you're gonna see that the greatest utility for those is gonna go in your incorporated cities where there's higher densities of, of, of population and folks. Uh, I'm certainly up to any idea and things we can do uh, to, uh, to make more units available. Uh, certainly support all the efforts we've done around ADUs, but even beyond that, that's, I understand there are two distinct issues. Um, and, and again, in the more rural areas, it's a little bit 
um, less of effective doesn't mean we shouldn't look at what what more we can do on 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 that. But I'm certainly up for that. Um, the second thing uh, I wholeheartedly support: look, the decline in the middle class tracks totally consistently with the decline of union membership uh, in this country and the outright war that's been launched by some of the wealthiest corporations in the world on labor unions is atrocious. Uh, and I believe it is un-American. It is rooted in greed uh, and not understanding basic issues of fairness, respect for hard work and workers' rights to collectively bargain. Uh, I will tell you when it comes to addressing uh, the needs of the unsheltered, you don't have homeless members of a union. Uh, you, you don't have union members uh, who, who can't find a home. You don't have seniors who have no way to pay uh, to, to, to live a life of dignity if they're retired union members with a pension. And so the, the continued erosion uh, of that protection of workers is, is, I think, a threat just to the fabric of who we are as a country, but also to our economic viability. The reality is when the middle class does better, our economy does better. Uh, working class and middle class folks spend the money they make. Elon Musk can make another billion dollars tomorrow. He can't possibly spend it. He also made his money on the backs of working class people who actually pay taxes because we subsidized his entire industry. And so I think we've got to really remain in the fight for basic issues of fairness and dignity and respect. I value hard work. I want people to get up and go to work, but I want you to go and work the job that pays you fairly. And so I support efforts around raising the minimum wage, around preserving the integrity of Social Security, but I also support strongly the efforts of increasing union density uh, in San Diego and, and across this country, uh, because that's how people will work hard and be in a position to be self-sufficient. Um, and it's the right thing to do. And I think that's just one of the most dominant and pressing issues of the, the day we face today. Uh, if we continue to allow workers to get misclassified, to get exploited, uh, to not be treated fairly, then taxpayers will be expected to step in and subsidize the difference. Um, think about a situation where someone who works full time and makes substandard wages and they can't afford a place to live. And so the answer everyone says is we'll provide rental assistance. Rental assistance would mean people who pay taxes who are not the uber wealthy will bridge the gap between greed on not paying people enough and greed on charging people too much. That is not sustainable. Um, so we have to care about the fight for good jobs and, um, and increasing union density. Uh, to make our economy and our community stronger. Thank you. Um, Chair Fletcher, from Verrill, has there been any changes by the Sheriff's Department since the truth hearing? Well, you got, look, you got to talk to the Sheriff on that, and I'm not passing the buck here. There's a misperception that the Sheriff works for me. The Sheriff does not work for me. A police chief works for the mayor and the city council. The Sheriffs are independently elected, uh, even if all five supervisors told them to change the policy, they, they don't have to change. Only the sheriff can change the, the, the policies that they see. Now, they have changed some policies as a result. Uh, one of the early Truth Act hearings, I was very critical. They had an inmate lookup system where you used to have to look up the inmate. You used to have to know the name of the inmate, and then you could see when they would be released. And that's for family members to be able to pick them up. Uh, once it was put in place, they couldn't coordinate with ICE anymore. Um, up, up, upon individuals release, then they changed the system to basically just list everyone's name and when they would be released. That was clearly designed to allow ICE to search the names and be there to meet people in the parking lot. They have now changed that system and reverted back. Uh, they don't allow uh, ICE access into the, into the jails other than what is legally required under California law. Uh, they provide inmates with all the information. And so I think we have moved in a better direction. The Sheriff's Department has moved in a better direction to be more in tune with issues surrounding SB 54 uh, and the California Values Act. And I think that is a, a good thing. So I, I, my opinion is they are doing a better job than they did in the past. And I think that's a combination of, of public pressure. And then finally recognizing, you know, this issue of sanctuary communities, communities gets a lot of um, attention. Uh, if you commit a crime, you will be held responsible for that crime, uh, regardless of your immigration status, as you should be. But we don't want a situation where local law enforcement is stopping people on the streets and if they are undocumented, turning them over to ICE because that erodes trust between the police and the communities who police them. We want a victim of a crime or a witness of a crime to be comfortable uh, talking to law enforcement. And the reality is an exhaustive study to the extent people care about actual facts and numbers show that sanctuary cities and counties are statistically safer 
they have lower rates of crime because again, you have to have that trust between the community and law enforcement. And in my mind, local law enforcement there is to protect and serve all who live there. Uh, it's the federal government's job and, and ICE's job. They can enforce border issues and they can do that, uh, but we don't need to deputize our local law enforcement agencies um, as ICE agents and, and the California SB 54 changed that. Uh, and I think our sheriff's department is moving sometimes slowly, but, but moving uh, in a better direction on those issues. And our last truth act form, uh, I thought was, was one of the better ones that we had had. Thank you. An additional question. Can you discuss the progress on your ghost gun ordinance and address some of the specifics such as safe storage, um, and ghost gun assembly, et cetera? Yeah, the ghost gun issues are the issue of, of unregistered, unserialized guns. Uh, people can, you know, take uh, a variety of parts and assemble a complete weapon. And in California, we have a rigorous background check process, a waiting process, um, and and those those are good things. Um, those are things we want in place. But those are things that are completely eroded uh, if people can just take all of the individual pieces uh, and assemble uh, a complete firearm. And so what we're doing around ghost guns is trying to to crack down on the unregistered, unserialized, unlicensed uh, guns in California. Really significant increase uh, year over year, uh, law enforcement seizing these guns. And so our ordinance is designed uh, to uh, try and put San Diego County on the forefront. I really wanna credit City Attorney Mara Elliott uh, and City Council Member Marnie Von Wilpert who really led on this issue in the city of San Diego. Um, and we are taking what they did and, and trying to do it uh, in the unincorporated areas. And then safe storage, any responsible gun owner ought to store their firearms safely. Uh, that means they're locked. Uh, that means that they are securely stored uh, in a way particularly children uh, cannot gain access to them. Um, and again, something the city of San Diego already did and, and we're following suit at the county uh, just with the hope of, of you know, trying to, trying to have a little bit more uh, safe uh, situation to protect people as best we can um, from, uh, from dangers of firearms. And one thing I'll say too, this is not just about uh, a criminal. The, the, the majority of deaths by firearms are suicide. Um, and a lot of those are individuals gaining access to a gun that, that may not be um, so again, and so the safe storage component uh, we think can help with that. And it's something that any responsible gun owner ought to already do. We're losing you a bit, Chair Fletcher. It's, okay. There, there you are. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We might have missed the last few sentences on that. It got a little jumbled. Oh, I'm sorry. That's it, yeah. We want to try to make people as safe as possible. Great, thank you. Um, what is your opinion of the success of the gun buyback effort? I'm not inherently a big fan of, of gun buyback programs. Um, you know, I suppose it doesn't hurt um, that you're, you're, you do it and you get some guns off the street, but you also can just kind of create a, a marketplace, um, you know, for doing that. I'm not opposed to them. Um, you know, I think you know, if we can limit the unregistered, unserialized ones, if we can have really rigorous background processes, background checks um, for individuals who are dangerous. Um, you know, California has, has done about everything I think they can, can reasonably do to uh, protect people on, on this issue. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm not a, opposed to gun buyback programs. Uh, I, I just don't know how much um, utility they, they, they yield, but I'm certainly fine to continue them. Thank you. Um, what should citizens of the county understand about COVID testing regarding availability, when to secure a test, and the role of the county in addressing the shortage of tests? Yeah, look, anytime you go from nobody wants a test to everyone wants a test, you're going to have a global uh, challenge and a, and a global shortage. And San Diego County was no different than any other county in California or any other state in, in the country, um, in that there just weren't enough testing components for enough healthcare staff uh, to be able to meet the need. Uh, our testing lines also got clogged with people who would come every single day for a test because they were curious. 
Uh, and I, I understand that, and I understand people were worried. Um, but as a county government, we only do about 10% of the, the, the testing that's done in the county. Um, the bulk of it is, is done by the healthcare systems and everyone else. And so we work to add hours, we work to add testing, we work to do everything. But again, if you go from 10 people that want something one day to 100,000 people that want it the next, you're going to have a backlog. Um, and so for the 10% that we provide, we try to provide more access and more screening. Um, and then we try to communicate a message to get a test if you need a test, um, if that's going to change what you do. Um, but, you know, if you have COVID related symptoms um, with the, the prevalence of Omicron throughout society, you should probably assume you have it uh, and, and act accordingly, get a test if you can. Um, the county also only does PCR tests as a public health lab. We only do PCR tests. Uh, we did get some rapid tests and then they were immediately we were directed to give them to the schools. Uh, to uh, help keep staff and teachers and kids uh, screen. And so the rapid tests we have, we gave a few number of libraries and then we were directed by the state to give them all to the schools. Um, obviously the federal government's now shipping them out. Uh, if you don't have that link, you can go on and get four of them mailed to you uh, at your house. Um, it you know, may, may come a, a little bit late, uh, but we certainly did every, everything we could to, uh, to, to meet the need. Great, thank you. Um, Catherine asks, county staff stated they needed a county supervisor to give them direction before they put Appendix O emergency housing of the 2019 CBC into the county's zoning ordinance to allow for tiny home communities and manufactured homes. Could you ask staff to put something together regarding the voluntary Appendix O for next Wednesday's zoning ordinance update to exempt emergency shelters? Yeah, that was a whole lot of very specific stuff. Abby on my team is here. Abby can share her, her email. If, if whoever has a suggestion, can Abby email the details? We can certainly look into it. I'd be happy to, to, to look into what, what we could do there. Um, Cooney asks, there is an effort to reduce slash prevent evictions with shallow subsidies of, for example, three to $400. Would the chairman and other supervisors be in favor of augmenting income through consultancy and other asset generation, especially for those on fixed income, such as Social Security, without penalizing the individual's qualifications? All right. Can you read that again? Yes. There's an effort to reduce or prevent evictions with shallow subsidies of three to $400. Would the chairman and other supervisors be in favor of augmenting income through consultancy and other asset generation, especially for those on fixed income, such as Social Security, without penalizing the individual's qualifications? All right, so I, I can't speak for any other supervisor. You gotta ask them. Um, we, I do support shallow subsidy programs. Um, and and I have, we, we, we launched when I was first there, um, our first what we called a regional flex pool for housing. Uh, some individual may need a shallow subsidy. Someone need their, may need their car repaired. They got to choose between do I fix my car or pay my rent. Um, you know, those are a lot of programs that are there. Uh, I know they can be particularly helpful for seniors uh, in particular. And I think that gets to your, to your point. So figuring out how we do that without compromising their ability. So yes, I support those programs. But, but I want to make an, an important point here in that when individuals aren't paid enough for the work they do and the housing costs too much, there is not enough money on the planet for government to step in and bridge the divide between institutional greed and not paying people well enough and not having enough housing. And so I support shallow subsidies and I support the regional flex pool for housing and I support whatever we can do to stop people from sliding into homelessness. But we cannot get away from the root cause of this, meaning if seniors had been paid more when they were working and if Social Security was more robust and if housing didn't cost so much, uh, they wouldn't need a shallow subsidy and they wouldn't need that. So yes, I support those efforts to try and stop people from sliding into homelessness. Um, but again, we gotta be careful because we can end up in a place where we're just subsidizing the differential uh, between people who don't make enough money and the cost of housing and, and there will not be enough funds out there, uh, no matter how well intentioned we are or how much we care about helping these individuals. Uh, we've got to attack the root cause of these issues. But I have read the research and I understand shallow subsidies in particular for seniors and I understand that the tax issues you're raising uh, and, and certainly supportive of, of, of doing what we can there. Thank you. 
I believe this is the last question. I understand that at one point there was a doubling of COVID cases in the Latino communities. Is that still the case? And if so, what are you doing to address this issue? Well, the Latino community got, got screwed from the beginning of COVID um, because they, you know, I, and you have historic health inequities of who has access to a doctor because unfortunately in this country, we ought to have universal single payer government health care for every single person out there. Uh, and, and we've never done that. And, and you have uh, communities uh, that have been left behind uh, surrounding that uh, issue. You have communities that had to go to work and service jobs in other areas. You have folks who density of housing are, are more vulnerable. Um, and so the Latino community across the country was hit harder. Now in our county, uh, we moved heaven and earth to provide more testing, uh, to provide more options. We work closely with our immigrant community to make sure immigrants weren't fearful of getting tested. Uh, or we provided income replacement funds for, for immigrants who might not be uh, able to access uh, unemployment insurance. Uh, when we did our vaccine, we had the highest utilization uh, anywhere in San Diego County in the south part of our county in the Latino communities. We hired healthcare workers to go door to door. We had Chroma Torres, community health workers. Uh, we cited our facility scenes for people in those hardest hit zip codes based on case rate uh, and health disparities. And, and I think, uh, you know, we, we, we did everything we could. But again, you're talking about, you know, 150 years of inequities that all hit in a pandemic. Um, and, and so we're going to continue, you know, to push and, and, and do more. But we very intentionally uh, focused our response to the communities that were hit hardest and the Latino community was without question hit hardest by COVID-19. Chair Fletcher, do you have time for one, one or two more questions? Sure. Okay. I believe this was answered, but I am being asked this question. Give me one sec. Um, it's regarding empty rooms in staffed hotels. Why are there empty rooms? because we don't have enough services to be able to provide services in the room. We don't have enough service providers. Um, the, the challenge in, in doing that is, is there are not enough service providers out there to provide the services. Even in the rooms where we had services provide, uh, we got widely criticized that the services were not enough. Um, and there is a critical shortage um, of folks who can provide mental health, substance abuse services, along with all of the other things around cleaning and staffing and food service. Uh, and this has been an ongoing challenge, which again is why I don't think a single one of the 18 incorporated cities who had the access to the same pot of funds that we did, the same pot of funds that we had access to run hotel programs, they all, and we shared with all of them how they could run their own programs in their incorporated jurisdictions and not a single one of them did it. Now I'm not criticizing them because they're very challenging, hard programs to run and providing the service providers um, to do it. But, just having an individual room by itself is not enough. You've got to be able to provide services to individuals who are in those rooms. Thank you. Um, question from Ted. If we are continually asking people to cut back on consuming water, why do we continue to add more homes and users of water? Well, this is a false choice. You can do both. You, you, can, you can conserve water um, and acknowledge that, that we have to build more housing. So whether it's smart scaping or native scaping or replacing with low flow toilets or other types of things that are entirely reasonable, we can be more efficient in the use of our water uh, and acknowledge, I believe that we need to build more housing in San Diego County. Now we got to put it in the right place. Uh, we got to do it right. I like it along transit corridors. I like it connected uh, closer to job centers and those, those, those types of things. Uh, but it is a absolute false choice to say that we cannot do a better job of conserving water with existing structures and acknowledge uh, that we've got to increase the, the availability of housing in our county. So I, I disagree, respectfully disagree with the premise of the question. Uh, I think you can and should do both. Thank you. This will be the last one. Um, back to behavioral health care. Did you say that the county is open to trying different models of treatment to find out what works and who is in charge of this program? Yeah, we've adopted a, a comprehensive harm reduction strategy, um, particularly around substance abuse uh, and, and mental health. And our director of behavioral health services 
uh, oversee and administer uh, all of those in and are all. Sorry, we lost you there, Chair Fletcher. Yeah, we're, we're, our behavior, the Department of Behavioral Health Services oversees all of those, and, and we're, we're always open to ideas for and suggestions for ways that we, we might be able to, to do it better. Okay, got it. I think we went through all of the questions. So thank you again, Chair Fletcher, for being here and joining us tonight. Thank you for all the work you do for the county and for our city, and congratulations on all of your accomplishments. Thank you all for joining us today for our Distinguished Speaker Series. For more information about the La Jolla Community Center, please visit our website. It's ljcommunitycenter.org. You can learn more about upcoming programs, and also we'll post the recording of today's uh, presentation there, too. So thank you again, Chair Fletcher. Thank you all. Thank you for having me. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night.